TorahCafe.com. So there was this Jew who uh, would go in every night to the bar to have a drink. And each night he would order two cups, two glasses of Crown Royal, make a lechayim, drink them, and uh, enjoy. And one night the bartender asks him, why don't you diversify your menu a little bit? Why is it always the same two glasses of Crown Royal? And he says, I'll tell you, I had a best friend. We would go each night for a drink. He would have a cup of Crown Royal. I would have a shot of Crown Royal. Unfortunately, he died. And I don't want to forget our friendship. So each night I come in and I drink two glasses of Crown Royal. One I drink for him. And one I drink for me. To carry the torch of our camaraderie forever. Okay, this goes on for 30 years. One night, he walks into the bar three decades later, and lo and behold, he orders one glass of Crown Royal. The bartender looks at him and says, what happened? He says, I'll tell you, I quit drinking. <laughs> now... This is, of course, a classic case of Jewish denial. <laughs> denial is not only a river in Egypt, it's also part of people's lives. But on a deeper level, it may also underscore a certain romantic wish for unity in which we don't only share the cup of loneliness, in Billy Joel's words, but we can also share the cup of joy in which uh, I'm drinking, but it's not really, I, I'm drinking, I quit, I'm just drinking for you. Relationships, all forms of relationships, and I was charged this morning to address uh, finding more meaning and happiness and wholesomeness in our relationships, whether it's in our marriages or other forms of relationships, all have those uh, cravings, those romantic wishes for drinking together, for sharing life in complete unison and integration. And yet, we all know that the challenges are often formidable even in good and more or less functional relationships. So today we want to explore a few perspectives that Torah, that Judaism, that Kabbalah offers that can help us navigate the tumultuous road towards deep, meaningful, happy, thriving relationships, whether it's with our spouse, whether it's with our children, whether it's with friends, whether it's with employers, employees, partners, or really any form of relationship, and everybody is involved in some form of relationship. Some of those paths and suggestions. I want to address, for starters, the fact that the Bible, the Torah, is a very complex book, meaning it usually does not make sense. None of the stories in the Torah ever leave you with a good feeling. <laughs> you never finish reading a story and it's like, you know, Cinderella. <laughs> and they lived happily ever after. First of all, nobody lives. <laughs> nobody is happy. <laughs> and it's certainly not ever after. I gave a lecture the other day, so there was a sign where I live in Muncie, New York. Why is my life a roller coaster? So I meet a Jew in the street, he says, I'm not coming to your lecture, which is a classic, wonderful, hospitable uh, <laughs> Jewish response. Good morning, I'm not coming to your lecture. I wanted to say, see if I care. <laughs> but the truth, <laughs> that's, I wished I could have said that, but I really did care. <laughs> 
So I'm like, that's so sweet. Why? <laughs> so he says, because my life is not a roller coaster. I say, really? Wow. He says, yeah, it's just going straight down. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> well, there's no story in the Torah that somehow leaves you content. Every story from beginning throughout the entire Hebrew Bible, the entire Tanakh, the five books of Moses, the 24 books of Moses, the prophets, the writings, each story is more complex, mysterious, enigmatic, strange, difficult, tragic, and sometimes very difficult to fathom and wrap your brain around one more than the other. Especially when it comes to the field of relationships. There's not one relationship in Genesis that seems functional. You'll forgive me. In fact, it may be said that the entire book of Genesis, the entire book of Veracious, is really a meditation about dysfunctional families. Which is really a good question. Is there any hope left? And I, <laughs> you're laughing. It's not so funny always. They say... <laughs> They say, what's the difference between a psychotic, a neurotic, and a psychiatrist? So I say the psychotic builds castles in the air, the neurotic lives in them, and the psychiatrist collects the rent from both of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in all of the stories, it seems like it's one or the other. So I'm not going to be the psychiatrist to collect the rent from all of them, but I do want to highlight a few components. Number one. The book of Genesis is a meditation about rivalry in families, there's no question. But there is succession and evolution. And I'll show you what I mean. In the first story, the first portion, the first two siblings that are ever born, Cain and Abel, what do they do to each other? It ends up with murder. Okay, which is what you do to your brother, either in action or at least in thought. <laughs> Cain murders his brother Abel. Okay, nobody lived happily ever after that. Hevel, Abel was gone. He was dead. And uh, Adam and Eve, anyway, had an old argument about some tree. She told him, eat. And he said, it's not healthy. And she said, you have to eat it anyway, just like here at the retreat. <laughs> and ultimately, he eats it, and then he blames her. You know what I mean? The guy's going to fress all the Danishes, gain 20 pounds. You were there. Why didn't you stop me? You gave me my plate. <laughs> and by the way, Adam is still blaming Eve, and most men are still blaming their wives for how they look. I told you, instead of coming to the lecture, you could have been in the gym, which is where you belong. You don't belong listening to more Jewish jokes. <laughs> okay. So, by the way, this is very important in relationships. You have to be able to laugh. What? No, no, no. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. If you could bring my mother-in-law, that would be great. <laughs> so the first sibling, the first two siblings, Cain kills Abel. The next situation is Noah has three children, right? Shame, Cham, Yafis, and one of them ends up being cursed by his own father. The next story is the siblings, Isaac and Ishmael. And how does that end up? It ends up in expulsion. The next situation, we have the next generation, two siblings, Jacob and Esau. Esau wants to kill Jacob, and he ends up running away. And although they come back, they meet 20 years later, they kiss each other, they embrace each other, but ultimately they go different ways. In the next story, we have Joseph and his brothers. They throw him into a pit. They sell him into slavery. 22 years later, they meet. Instead of revenge, Joseph welcomes them to Egypt. He takes care of them and their families. And Genesis ends on that note. Jacob dies, Joseph dies. The brothers are living in Egypt in peace and harmony. 
So really, the book of Genesis begins with two brothers killing each other, or one brother killing his other brother, and it continues, and it ends up with brothers almost killing each other, and yet they manage to create that magic we call forgiveness. It gets better in the beginning of Exodus when Moses and Aaron actually work together. And that's a great miracle. Not only do they look at each other, not only do they speak to each other, not only are they at peace, but they actually work together to create redemption. And only after that is the Torah given to the Jewish people. So essentially, much of the book of Genesis is a meditation about this level of rivalry. They say there was a Jewish couple celebrating their 50th anniversary. At the feast, she gets up and says, I want to make a toast to myself for sticking it out with him for 50 years. A toast to him for sticking it out with me for 50 years. And I want to tell you, 50 years of my marriage passed like two days. People were impressed. A Jewish couple, after 50 years, not only are they on speaking terms, but apparently it was so romantic, it just flew by like two days. There was one nudnik in the crowd. He says, excuse me, ma'am, why do you say it went by like two days? Why don't you say it went by like one day? She says, because our marriage for 50 years has been like two days, Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. <laughs> now, those are, the two, those are the two toughest days or saddest days in the Jewish calendar, right? So, I want to... I want to try to point out at least three moments in the book of Genesis which can give perspective. Moment number one. How is the first relationship between a husband and wife described in the Bible? Adam and Eve are the first couple. Their marriage is literally made in heaven. No pun intended. And the Torah uses a peculiar or interesting term to describe their intimate relationships. Anybody remembers it? Very well. Adam yada et chava. Adam knew Eve. That is how the Torah chooses to define physical sexuality the first time it's ever mentioned. A little strange. It's not like the Bible is bashful of using the term quite explicitly as it does numerous times. But with Adam and Eve, it chooses a different term. Adam knew Eve. Yada, from the word yada, la da'at, da'at, knowledge, awareness. But, I don't know how to say this nicely. We all know lots of people. Yeah, it's not funny. I'm also not laughing. Don't worry. For those who are not laughing, I also don't find it funny. They found it funny. <laughs> but that's not my problem. But there perhaps is a very deep message here. The beginning and genesis and foundation of intimacy is really getting to know another person. In fact, it may be, even be the meaning of the English term, intimacy, into, me, see. You have to be able to really see into me, and I have to really be able to see into you. What does it mean to really get to know a person? How many of us take the time, and most importantly the mental space, to really get to know and understand truly and thoroughly and deeply our partner, the other person? Friedrich Nietzsche once said, we don't love other people, we love our version of them. We create a version of our friend or our partner or our spouse or our child in our mind, and that is what we love. But do I ever take the real time and energy to get to know you on your terms, not on my terms? Adam knew Eve. He actually took the time to really know who this person is. Even before that, when God introduces the notion of a relationship, He says, Lo tov adam levado. It's not good for man to be alone. Eseloi ezer kenegde, I'm going to create a helper against him. And that seems to be the best description of marriage. A helper against him. Really? 
I thought the spouse was supposed to be supportive. No. The first time marriage is described, a helper against him. Well, if she's a helper, she's not against him. If she's against him, she's not a helper. But the Torah is really saying something very profound. This is pointed out by two commentators, Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi and Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, the Nitziv. And they both give a similar explanation, and that is sometimes you help a person most by disagreeing with them, by being against them. Now, when you leave this lecture and somebody says, what did the rabbi say? I'm not sure you should say the rabbi said that it's a biblical commandment to disagree with your spouse, to make sure you're always against them. But the point that is being made is that when people disagree with us, especially people who are close to us, we often see it as a source of contention, when we should often see it as a source of enlightenment. The fact that you disagree with me actually allows me to broaden my horizons and see a larger perspective in life. So why is it that so many of us go crazy? when somebody disagrees with us, especially if that person is in our house. The greatest blessing is to have somebody who can challenge you and demonstrate to you a perspective that you may not have instinctively embraced or thought of because of the limitations of your character and which character is not limited. So there's a t-shirt that reads, I'm easy to get along with once you learn to worship me, <laughs> which is the model some people have for marriage. The Torah's model is a helper against. If I'm only against you, then it's not going to work. If I want to help you, but part of being there for somebody is that we often disagree. We have divergent personalities, divergent views, divergent perspectives. It's when I can create space for your view and your perspective that my own life can get enhanced. I don't become a prisoner of my own stereotypes, of my own narrowness, of my own ego, of my own insecurities. And then Adam can actually get to know Eve, understand who this person is, really take time and energy to study who your wife is, who your husband is. And the same is true with other relationships. That real ability to know who that other person is, not only how you define them and what you expect from them. We now come to another point. And here is a little trivia question. The word love in Hebrew is ahava. Right? Ahavta, you should love. It's a very charged word, it's a very powerful word. When is the first time? that the word love, Ava, is mentioned in the Torah. Anybody? First time. Who is the first lover? Who loves first in the Torah? The first time love is mentioned in the Torah. I'll give you a hint. Some men say it every single morning. <laughs> and some women. Ah? Avram to Yitzchak. Where? Oh, very good. Good. The first love in the Torah is in the end of the portion of Ayera. It's said every morning before the morning services in the story of the binding, the Akedah. It's an interesting place to insert love. Very good. God tells Abraham, God tells Avram, the first patriarch, Kachna et bincha et yichidcha asher ahafta et yitzchak. Take your son, your only son, the son that you love. This is the first time love is mentioned. God says to Avram, I know that you love your son Isaac. What is the second time love is mentioned? Isaac loves Rebekah. Yitzchak loves his wife Rivka. Do you see the pattern? The first person who is loved is Yitzchak, Isaac. The second person who loves is Yitzchak. He is loved by his father and he loves his wife. And then the third time, it continues. His wife Rivka loves her son Yaakov. Yitzchak loves his son Esau. Yaakov, who is loved by his mother, loves Rachel. And so the pattern continues throughout Genesis. 
and the message is subtle but clear. Yitzchak is loved, and therefore he loves. His father truly loves him. God says so, and therefore he really loves his wife. Why is it so? Of course, somebody who's loved knows what it is. I can give to others what I have. I can't give you what I don't have. If I hate myself, if I despise myself in a very deep place, can I really love you? I can love you perhaps out of guilt. I can love you perhaps because I feel that there's nothing in me to love and therefore I love you. But if my eye is really shattered, if my eye really has no value, can that I truly embrace you as another human being? What you have, you can give to somebody else, but it really goes a step deeper. And namely, when a person doesn't really respect and appreciate their core identity, they could never really love because they could never afford to suspend themselves and create space for others as they're always trying to fill a bottomless pit, an endless void to feel their own value. Practically speaking, if I'm in a conversation with you, if I'm in a conversation with my spouse, if I'm in a conversation with a friend, I'm always searching for validation, for recognition, for approval, for somebody to tell me or intimate to me that I'm good, I'm worthy, I'm fine, I'm lovable, I'm a great guy, I'm skinny, I'm handsome, I'm slim. Whatever adjectives. But the bottom line is, I need to fill that void because I don't have it on my own. I don't feel that I really exist. I don't feel that I don't like myself. So I always need your validation. So now when this spouse comes home in the evening and the other spouse, whoever it is, a husband or a wife, starts sharing their day, and how difficult the day was, it's very hard for this person to actually listen and empathize because they are waiting for their own void to be filled by the other person. They're waiting for compliments. They're waiting for accolades. They're waiting for approval and validation. It's very hard for me to be here for you when my eye is completely shattered or partially shattered. Only when I am in a wholesome space can I now suspend myself and really be here for you on your terms and not only be here for you so that you can be here for me so it's really a conditional relationship. Isaac is loved and therefore he's capable of really loving. Avraham loved him. Isaac had that core. So now he could be there for his spouse. He could be there for Rivka. And when a person does not have this for whatever reason, they must, as adults, have the courage to find it within themselves. As King David writes in Psalms chapter 27, My mother and father have abandoned me, but God took me in. A person ought to discover at some point in life that there is an unconditional love of the creator of the world to them and that nothing can shatter their core dignity. No force in the world, no abuse in the world, no aggressor in the world can take away from you the infinite value and dignity of your core soul. The Tanya defines the soul as a chelik alekami mal, a fragment of God. Just like no abuser can destroy God, no abuse or, or aggression in the world can deny you from your essential, divine, sacred, and wholesome core. When you can operate life from that place, it's nice to get compliments. It's nice to get validation. I love it. I'm sure there's a few of you who love it. But the question is, am I dependent on it? Do I need it as oxygen? How do I deal with it when I don't get it? Is there a healthy, wholesome core? And then I can love. I can just be here for somebody else. Sometimes people carry around a toxic message of self throughout all of their relationships. 
They don't even realize it, but they have three washing machines on their shoulders. And therefore they could never even for a moment breathe and truly listen to the other because there's so much internal, unresolved pressure. But for this you have to be very self-aware. And let's face it, many of us are experts on everybody else but ourselves. We know who everybody else is. It's very hard to be self-aware. It's extremely difficult to be able to feel what is really going on in us. And in a relationship, it becomes so toxic because what happens often is, in so many relationships is, couples are projecting on each other things that have nothing to do with the other person. It has completely to do with them. I probably told you last year what the Kotzke Rebbe said in Yiddish. It's one of the better lines I've heard in my life. Anybody wants to repeat that? If I am I because you are you and you are you because I am I, I am not I and you are not you. But if I am I because I am I and you are you because you are you, then I am I and you are you. And now we can begin a relationship. And what the Kutzke Rebbe was one of the great Hasidic masters, his name was Rabbi Menachem Mendel Morgenstern. He lived in the 19th century, passed away in the 1850s. What he meant was, I think what he meant was this. If there is no I, if my entire I is defined by you, then I am not I and you are not you. Your you is based on I and my I is based on you. There can't be a relationship. There's such entanglement, there's so much toxicity, there's so much blame, there's so much lack of, of transparency, of clarity, of a real relationship. It's not going to work. I am I, you are you. Now let's talk. <laughs> Now let's fight, now let's argue, <laughs> now let's joke, but I and you, the boundaries. In Hebrew there are two words, one word is ahava, one word is kavod. Ahava means love, kavod means respect. There's a very big difference between love and respect. The students of Rabbi Akiva, the Talmud says, did not respect each other. So the commentators ask, Rabbi Akiva is the one who taught that love is the most important principle in the Torah. The answer is, it doesn't say they didn't love each other. They did love each other. They didn't respect each other. Because they loved each other, they didn't respect each other. Because sometimes I love you so much, I see you as me and I'm you and you're me and we're one. Ahava is the numerical value of 13, which is the same numerical value of the word echad. One. Because love is one. I'm you, you're me. We need love, but we need respect. Respect means I am not you and you are not me. There are boundaries. I respect your space. You respect my space. In an environment of respect, love can flourish. Without respect, love is powerful, but it swallows up. It can crush. It can overwhelm. And ultimately, it could become so entangled and for respect, you need very deep honesty. Who am I? And who are you? What is my issue? And what is not? And to be able to develop those honest boundaries is a great feat. I've often said one of the interesting insights of Torah may be very powerful. Every relationship wants two dimensions. What the masters, the Kabbalists called a relationship like fire and a relationship like water. What's the difference between a relationship like fire and a relationship like water? Fire is very hot and passionate. Water can be still and relaxed. We all want a relationship that is fiery, electrifying in a good way, full of warmth, full of romance, full of excitement and stimulation. On the other hand, we also want relationships that are normal, relaxed, cool, collective. Every couple I know will complain of one of two things. Either there's no passion or there's so much passion we're killing each other. Can't we just be normal business partners, normal friends? There's one problem. No scientist has invented the formula to create complete integration between fire and water. When you put fire near water, one of the two happens. 
Either the water evaporates or the fire gets extinguished. Either you have a marriage of fire or you have a marriage of water. Which one? Came the Torah 3,300 years ago and presented the blueprint of Judaism. And that is, two weeks fire, two weeks water. And this is profound, because fire and water don't mix. You need a pot separating. The Talmud says at the end of Tractate Brachis, if you dream about a pot, you should anticipate peace. Anybody here dreaming about pots? <laughs> I dream about food, not about pots. But if you dream about pots, you should anticipate peace. <laughs> Why? So one of the commentators says, because a pot makes peace between fire and water. The fire warms the pot, the pot warms the water, and the fire and water live in peace happily ever after. Two weeks fire, two weeks water. Two weeks the Torah says, fire! Let it be passionate, let it be warm, let it be hot, let it be exciting, let it be atomic. No pun intended. But two weeks, water, respect, space. Learn not to take the other person for granted. Learn that you don't own the other person. The other person is not an object for your enjoyment. Learn to talk about things, not just cover up issues through physical contact, which is great in the right time. But learn to respect the space between each other. This is covered, not ava. I'm going to ask each and every one of you, next time, in any relationship you're in, it could be marriage, over there it's very dominant, but really any relationship, and somebody makes a comment, somebody does something, and it really, really gets you sugar inside. And your brain goes haywire. You don't explode, you implode, but you implode. You make faces, like, here she goes again. Here he goes again. Why did I ever get into this? My mother was right. <laughs> Don't laugh too loud. <laughs> now, when you're angry, you're angry. It's very hard to think when you're angry. You have to relax. But when you're relaxed... Go deep down, maybe with the help of somebody, and search. And you will see that in many situations, what was ticking you off wasn't the actual word of the other person, but it was something inside of you that's unresolved. And that was just a trigger. It was a smoke screen. So even though you're getting upset at the other person, really they're just bringing up something in you that is an old void and hasn't been dealt with. When you fully love yourself, you can really love somebody else. Because when you fill up all your voids, when you fill up all your voids, you don't go to other people to fill your voids. Because they can't. You can't fill my voids. I could fill them with my God. You could fill them with your God. When you can really fill your voids, you can really love all the time. And the reason is... Because you don't get entangled and you could create the boundaries and you can create the space to let another person in without the danger and the feeling that you're going to melt in the process. Yitzchak loved because he was loved. When the Torah describes intimacy between Isaac and Rebekah, the Torah says, Yitzchak metzachek es rifka ishtay. Not Adam knew Eve. You know how the Torah describes intimacy between Isaac and Rebekah? Anybody? When the Torah wants to describe the intimacy between Isaac and Rebekah, what's the word? What does that mean? <laughs> Laughing. They laughed. They laughed. They jested. That's how it describes intimacy. That's the second term for intimacy. Adam knew Eve. Isaac jested with Rebecca. 
Now, you'll forgive me again. Many of us are laughing. Okay, nobody got that. Fine. Is this really the best term for intimacy? Isaac laughed with Rebecca. But there is a profound message here as well. What makes people laugh? Why do you laugh at some jokes and you don't at others? What generally makes anybody laugh? Anybody? The truth, discomfort, sharp. But often, if I go over to you and I tell you the truth about you, <laughs> it's not funny. It's a huge relief. But what's the relief? If I come over and I tell them ex exactly what I think about them, it's usually not so funny. It's a release. How does the joke do that? How does comedy achieve that release? Contrast. Very good. Contrast. Paradoxes. The punchline always has to be unexpected. <laughs> The great comedian takes you to a certain place. You think it's hilarious. He or she takes that sudden turn and it becomes a laugh within a laugh within a laugh and then another turn and another turn. The more unexpected, the greater the laughter. That's why a joke that you hear six, seven times, right? You're usually not going to laugh at the punchline because you heard it already and it's expected, even though it's quite funny for somebody who hears it the first time. You probably remember the story about the Three Jews who retired in Palm Beach, they would golf every day, and they, they would drink gin and play cards and say jokes, and everybody knows there are only 250 jokes that are recycled. 50 about rabbis, 50 about lawyers, 60 about mothers-in-law, 40 about wives, etc. 100 about food, 50 about anti-Semitism, they just get recycled. So instead of saying these jokes, these old men, to save their time, they just gave every joke a number. And everybody would say, number 10, number 12, number 20, number 30. And then a new guy joins them. And everyone is throwing out numbers and laughing. And he feels lonely and bored. He doesn't understand. He wants to feel part of the group. So he throws out a number. He's like, 71. Nobody laughs. He's like, why aren't you laughing? They say, you have to know how to tell a joke. <laughs> so... All humor comes from the unexpected. Isaac laughed with Rebecca. That's the term for intimacy. Isaac laughed with Rebecca. Real intimacy is about a joke. <laughs> it's about laughter. Why is that? You see, it's natural for people to get into a conflict. I have my ego, you have your ego. I have my insecurities, you have yours. I have my Meshagasin, you have yours. I have my idiosyncrasies, you have yours. Yes, even you. The only people I know that are perfect are the people I don't know well. For a couple to get into a fight, welcome, good morning, of course. That's natural, that's expected. Isaac and Rebecca had a unique ingredient. They knew how to laugh. What is laughter? Laughter is celebrating the unexpected. When Isaac and Rebecca were about to get into a fight, and trust me, they had a lot to argue about. They were opposite in disposition. He was introverted. She was extroverted. He was internal. She was out there. He loved Esau. She loved Jacob. They had a lot to argue about. Their secret of intimacy was laughter. They said to themselves, you know what? It's natural to fight. It's normal. Are we going to the retreat this year? What type of movie are we going to see? What type of restaurant? Every small issues and big issues. That's natural. The secret of the human being, the secret of life is the ability to be able to laugh. Isn't it interesting? What was the name of the first boy born as a Jew? What's his name? Yitzchak. What does Yitzchak mean? Laugh, a joke. Yeah. Who names their child a joke? <laughs> Imagine your mother would give you that name. What would your therapist tell you about your mother? 
What's your name? A joke. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> Great for self-confidence, right? You are a joke. Your whole essence is a joke. Really. Nobody takes me seriously. Nobody ever took me seriously. At my bris, they named me a joke. At my bris, they didn't take me seriously. I'm crying, and they're saying he's a joke. By the way, my name is Yitzchak, so I know what it feels like. I speak from personal experience. And I'm not over it yet. But I have Abraham to blame. He names the first Jewish kid Yitzchak. You know why, friends? The essence of the Jewish story is the ability to laugh. That's the Jew. Why? Not only because we love humor, and not only because we have so many issues that we need the release of humor. It's really much deeper. It's really the purpose of creation because before creation, oh, everything was predictable. In creation, everything is predictable. Every creature, every part of the universe, at least on the surf and on the micro. Uh, uh, to get into quantum mechanics where it's unpredictable is a little complicated, but at least what we observe, it's predictable. There's only one part of the world that's unpredictable. That's the human race. We are capable of being unpredictable. And therefore, we're capable of making God laugh and making history laugh. I may be in the mood of being obnoxious to my wife. I may say, I'm not buying flowers this week after what she said. And all my friends in the Schwitz agree. Because they all have great marriages. And then despite my instincts, despite my mood, I buy the roses with a beautiful cart. And God is like, wow, that's funny. That was an unexpected punchline. I wake up in the morning, I'm self-centered, I'm narcissistic. I'm not in the mood of anybody or anything. I challenge myself. I meditate, I pray, I connect. God says, that was a funny joke. Isaac and Rebecca could have fought all the way down throughout their marriage. What was the secret of their intimacy? The ability to laugh. The ability to say, we're so different, and that's funny. Our paths are divergent. For us to separate? Of course, that would be normal. <laughs> For us to get divorced? Okay. I know a guy who came to a rabbi, he says, I want to get divorced. Rabbi says, who doesn't? <laughs> you ever heard of somebody? Shine, welcome. Shine. Nachachachem from the Manashtan. People ask me, why is there 50% divorce in America? I'm like, why not? Why not? She lives with the guy two years. He's a shlemiel, he's a shlemazel, he's a nudnik. He's a shmegagi shine. Nothing personal. I don't mean you, I mean your brother. <laughs> Conflicts? Okay. Conflicts are not created by anything else. Conflicts are created by human beings. We fight. We all have issues. The uniqueness of a powerful relationship is the ability to laugh. The ability to create an unexpected punchline. Isaac looked at Rebecca and said, we can go different ways, but you know what? We were created to laugh. We were created to do the unexpected. We were created to challenge our egos. You know what we were created for? That our souls should surprise our minds, that our souls should surprise our egos, that our souls should surprise our moods. Thank you very much.